fixing things up that sloppy people break, finding things that sloppy people lose, and cleaning dishes that sloppy people leave in the sink. It's hopeless. So that was part of the play, which had many satirical parts of it, but that was one that had to do with me the sloppiness. Now that weekend, um, Sunday, uh, Max and I were approached by uh, 50 people in the audience who had seen the play and said, so, and they were psychologists themselves, and said, that thing about me is sloppy. That's really true. That it was funny and also true. And as psychologists, we don't really know why people are neat and sloppy. And very little has been written about it. So Max and I were saying, it's just kind of interesting. And when we wrote the play, we never had the idea that we were going to make a project out of it. But we said, since so many people have raised it, and we could search the, uh, all the uh, records and find that there are no psychological answers to the specific problem. So we decided to create a project for ourselves, the two of us, in which we would interview and canvas couples that would be in shopping centers and um, outdoor festivals all over the country, but particularly in California and New York, because I had my practice in New York and Max had lived in California. So over a period of eight years, we would go into, we would go in California, if we were working with Max, he had a camper, and we would go down to San Diego, which is the southern part of California, he lived in Los Angeles, and over a period of four or five weeks, we would go town to town, and we would see couples walking together, and we'd say, would you mind if we discuss a project that we're working on? And we have some questionnaires we'd like you to answer, and it has to do with me. This is sloppiness. Well, what couple comes were very amenable to it. They laughed a little. They said, "Yeah, yeah, we will." So we continued that until, say, in that four-week period, we may have spoken to oh, maybe about 400 couples that we met. And we took all this information down. We were collecting data, and during the day, Max and I would. When we finished the canvassing, we would um, examine what we had learned from these people and make conjectures about the little writing, and we just put it in a basket and keep working. Well, then we did the same thing in New York. A couple of weeks later, we started in Florida, we went all the way up to Maine. Only we didn't have a camp yet. That, at that time, we had to sleep at hotels. But we collected during that period close to 2,000 questionnaires doing with, to do with these issues and these documents. Well, about this time, uh, we were doing a lot of reading and corresponding with universities and people that might have other information we could deal with. So we read about a project that was being done at the uh, Caltech in California where a, um, a group of scientists and surgeons were working on an issue of um, uh, epilepsy. The government had sponsored this fund, and they gave this to the school. and had to work there on it over a period of oh, 10 or 12 years. And they experimented with cats that had epilepsy. And they conjectured that if they had cut the corpus callosum, which is that group of nerves in between the left and the right uh, hemisphere, they would stop the seizures that these cats were having. And sure enough, it proved successful. It didn't destroy the cats, it just cut those, um, those wires in between the two hemispheres and he said, Jesus is wonderful. Now, well, none of these kids have seizures. None of these cats have seizures anymore. So a little later on, one of the top um, surgeons who was uh, working on this project, Joseph Bogan, world famous, really, and um, 
Francis Perry, who received the Nobel Prize for this project, and Michael Dizaniger, another scientist working on this, they decided to, to let out a, um, uh, a call for people all over the country, all over the United States, who had epilepsy that was not being treated successfully with drugs. And if they would agree to an operation which they really feel would be successful in limiting their seizures. Well, sure enough, they had 21 volunteers. And these volunteers were amazed that after the operations and they recovered over a period of weeks, 19 of them were successfully free of seizures. And they solved the problem of epilepsy. It became world famous as medical information. Well, although the reason they indulged in this project was to deal with epilepsy, but, but it turned out psychological, because many of the people working on the project were also psychologists. For the first time in history, they had volunteers, these patients who were cured of epilepsy, who agreed to a, a period, to a group of experiments that would be done with them to determine if the separation of their two hemispheres would make any difference in their functioning, or if they could block off one hemisphere and give tests that would only go to one hemisphere, what would be the difference? For the first time over a period of years, this is during the 60s and early 70s, they were able to compile a tremendous amount of information about what the left and the right hemisphere do and that they are basically working independently, that the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere are different, have different functions, and one doesn't know what the other is doing. But in a normal person, these two hemispheres would communicate. But now since their corpus callosum was severed, they couldn't communicate anymore. So they had very, very valuable information. And then universities all over the country in Europe were trying to get in on this project because they were interested in it. They got published a tremendous amount of uh, professional papers on the subject. And so they had a lot of literature on it. And when Max and I read about it, we decided to go to LA and see if we could find uh, the um, university, Caltech, and meet some of the people who were involved in it. And if this would have bearing on what we were looking for, regarding the difference between the two hemispheres, if they had any impact on the zombies. Well, we attended a lecture when we got to LA. With Joseph Golden was speaking. He was the surgeon who performed all the operations. And as we were watching the uh, lecture, I noticed that Dr. Bolton was lecturing in front of the why was that? So I decided to uh, let him know about it, and I wrote a little note, and it walked up in front of his podium, and I handed him this piece of paper, and it sat down. Well, then we sat down, he looked at me, and he looked at the paper, and he, he walked behind the lectern, and he gave me a wink. Well, that was the beginning of a fantastic friendship. Because after the lecture, Joseph Bogan uh, came over to thank us, and we became very friendly. He took us out to dinner, and we talked until midnight about all of our ideas and bearing on what his work had been. So over a period of one period of time, we maintained a relationship with Dr. Bogan, and we would write to him, he'd write to us, he'd call us, he'd send us information, so we were able to uh, substantiate a lot of the things that we were doing. As a matter of fact, everything we have in this book is totally documented. Anyway, I'd like to get into the... Uh, I'd like to get into the PowerPoint now. Okay. This I'm talking to about. We decided to canvas all the shopping centers. We interviewed couples, but they didn't even sloppy. We went to Caltech. 
coming up their information. The first time in history, scientists, is everyone hearing me now? For the first time in history, scientists were able to track the differences between the left and right hemisphere of the brain. Well, over a period of seven or eight years, Max and I continued our research, and we continued to correspond with um, professors from all over the country, different universities and in, in Europe as well, about what we had found and how we were using the information create something as a factor in personality which had been overlooked in all psychological theories. None of the famous psychologists of the day, to that time were aware of the impact of the left and right hemisphere being something that affected our perspective on life. And if you were, and everyone was, was born with a dominant in one or the other, People who were born with a dominant left brain or a dominant right brain it wouldn't mean that they didn't have both, but they would be more important. And so it would go to the way they behaved. Okay, now this is a, this is a drawing of the two sides of the brain, uh, indicating the, the qualities of each side. Now, you know, the left brain brain has analytic qualities, they're organized, they think step by step. They're detailed and conscious, they're intellectual, they're structured, they're conscious, they're rational, verbal, they're time-oriented, oriented, and they have linear thinking, and they're logical. Now on the other hand, you notice that that drawing on the left side is all very rectilinear, because it expresses what the left brain is, that's the way it thinks in linear ways. Now the right brain is done with round designs giving all the opposite kind of experiences like they think in images, they're sensual, they're, they're abstract, they're mysterious, they're timeless, which means that the right brain of left to its own is generally made for appointments, put it mildly, but they're not concerned about keeping the form choice concerned with linear time, whereas the left brain is very concerned with linear time. Uh, they're intuitive, they're holistic in thinking, they're spontaneous, which means that they're, uh, they act without thinking that much. They're irrational, they're spatial, they're inarticulate. There's no language in the right brain. They're disorganized, then they generally behave in terms of uh, immediate gratification and they tend to be creative and want things done now. Now these are the same kind of things only a different form. Now this you have on your handout, but you can really study and understand where is the, the left brain it has words and language. The right brain identifies patterns and images. They don't have words and language. The left brain is verbal and the right brain is nonverbal. The left brain is time conscious and the right brain is spatial. The left brain is practical and the right brain is fantasy based. Um, the left brain assigns meaning to things and the right brain tends to daydream and work out of impulses. The left brain is cautious before making decisions and the right brain is a risk taker. The left brain follows rules and schedules and the right brain is spontaneous. The left brain is factual and detailed, and the right brain is visual and conceptual. The left brain is analyzes ideas, and the right brain synthesizes, it seems to collect things together. Um, the left brain classifies and judges, and the right brain is indifferent to order. The left brain processes sequentially, and the right brain processes randomly. Uh, the left brain has objectifies and the right brain values sensation. The left brain here is neat and the right brain is sloppy. The left brain is rectilinear as you saw in the drawing and the right brain is curvilinear. The left brain turns play into work 
and the right brain turns work into play. The left brain is emotionally positive and the right brain is emotionally negative. The left brain is obsessive and the right brain is addictive. Okay. Now, these are examples of the things that people who are left brain will complain about with right brain partners. They claim they get too emotional, they're too extroverted, they won't stay on one topic, they're too sensitive, they don't appreciate the way I show my caring, never put things away, clutters are horizontal surfaces, always late, always on the phone, and it's doing both. And the complaint that left brain people have of, of right brain people, Complaints that left brain people, oh, that right brain people, no, that's not, is emotionally unavailable to me. Okay. This is even explain to right brain people that left brain people are too emotional, are, are too inhibited, can't let go, they don't like to chat, they won't talk about feelings, they're not romantic, they're too rigid, they're always organizing things, they're always straightening things up very impatient, too concrete, too gorgeous. Okay, now, one of the things I want to make clear is that the obstacle syndrome theory is not a measure of intelligence, it's not a measure of character, and it's not a measure of, uh, of emotional health, which means that you can be a left brain person or a right brain person, and it doesn't mean you're a good person or a bad person, or that you're too emotional or unemotional. But people tend to, when they look at these theories, they think to that that one being more left brain or more left brain is better than the other, and it's not. Because both of them have equal qualities when they're intermixed. So what the uh, author said it is, is understanding how the brain dominates the uh, left about how the brain dominant affects our perception and personality. Okay, this is an example of how opposites attract. There's a couple, they're very attracted to each other. The guy that sees this woman is being very, very ethereal. And she sees him as being in my big power, it's wonderful, and she's deeply, deeply in love with him. And then five years later, she thinks it's because she was more down to her, she's kind of wacky. And the right brain, and she thinks it's not logical. He thinks it's not logical. He never, uh, he never shares his feelings, that's a complaint. But therefore, the relationship is not working very well. Okay. Okay, now we're going to go into some, some tests. And this is something I'd like you to write and score for yourself and you can score on, your, on the paper that you have. These are questionnaires. These are questionnaires that we are either true or false for you. Now, this is us, nothing that we're going to be judged by. You don't have to hand the paper in. It's strictly for your own information. So if we look at this, the first one is I made concrete plans for the future. Now, is that true or false for you? If it's true, put a check. If it's false, put a zero. There's no in between. It. <laughs> what, what I'm saying is this, this, this question is a very generalized kind of thing. It's not looking for fine points. You have other tests that do that. So if you're more, if it's more true for you or more not uh, unfalse for you, uh, that is that right. Number two, I consider myself a thrower rather than a saver. Now, is that true or untrue to you? Number three, I have no trouble keeping my personal papers organized. Is that true or false to you? And I want you to mark whether it's, because you're going to count these things up for yourself. So mark down whether they're true or false in each case. Number four, I squeeze a tube, a tube of toothpaste from the bottom and replace the cap. Is that true or untrue? Mm -hmm. Number 
Number five, I seldom rely on my intuition in assessing new people. True or false? Number seven, I find keeping order a bother, but I do it anyway. True or false? I have trouble finding my keys. Number eight. Number nine, I don't consider hunches very important in making decisions. True or false? On vacations, I enjoy set plans rather than spur the moment activities. True or false? And then it's a checker with your own. Number 11, I am impelled to find specific places to put things. True or false? Number 12, after planning my day, I resist intrusions that may put me off the track. Number 13, I seldom rely on my emotions when making decisions. I'm sorry, did I miss you at that time? Yeah. Oh, no, they're not, no. Here's what I wanted to say. There are more questions on here than you have on your sheet. So just answer true or false on a step on the same place just to get the, uh, the reading. But these are extra ones that were on the real questionnaire. I didn't want to include them on that because it's but just continue with these, say true or false. There's only 20 of them. I seldom rely on my emotions when making decisions. 13. 14. I rarely gesture when I talk. True or false. Before I take a stand on an issue, I get all the facts. 16. I really lose track of time. True or false? When I'm confused, I seldom rely on my gut instinct. 17. 18. I usually have a place for everything, a system for doing things, and the ability to organize information and materials. 18. Are you with me now? Yeah. Oh, did you want to go back? Did you which which one didn't you get? Oh. Which which one are we up to? Are you up to seventeen? No. Oh, you didn't do any of these? I know you don't have them, I'm saying. It doesn't matter if you have it on your sheet. But it's the same thing, is it true or false for you? Just make a separate listing on your paper. So I'll go over them quickly again. Okay? 13, I tell them rely on my emotions when making decisions. True or false? You can just say 13, true or false. Number 14, I rarely gesture when I talk. Number 15, before I take stand on an issue, I get all the facts. Number 16. Number 15. You got that? Number 16, I rarely lose track of time. Number 17, when, I, when I'm confused, I seldom rely on my gut instinct. True or false? Number 18, I usually have a place for everything, a system for doing things, and the ability to organize information and materials. 
Okay, now this is the last of them. Again, you're gonna, you don't have it on your sheet, but I'd like you to make, make a list of that, okay? Is that, is that confusing? No. Okay. Okay. Number 19, are you all with me in 19? Yes. 19, when speaking, I usually use exact and precise terms and rarely use metaphors. True or false? Number 20, I usually refer to social situations, prefer social situations that are planned in advance. True or false? Number one, 21, problem solved through logic rather than through emotions. True or false? I dislike long chats on the phone. True or false? Number 23, I would not rely on hunches to make important decisions. Number 24, when I see clutter around my home, it bothers me a great deal. Okay. Now, what I'd like you to do is add up all of your true statements. Did everyone add up all the true statements? Okay, now add up all your false statements. I put a number on them. I want you to add. Okay, now on the true statements, how many people raised your hand? How many, how many uh, people that put true have more than 10 true? Okay, and now on your false statements, how many, how many people have more than 10? Okay, okay, so that, the information on that, okay, I'll tell you what it is. Some of those statements, excuse me, some of those statements are what we call left brain statements. They're the kind of statements that a person who has left brain dominance will call that true. That's the ones that you mark true. The ones that you mark false are the ones that a right brain person would pick. So you can see there, the, the number of people have their hands up that there are more left brain people, dominant people, than right brain dominant people. So this is like a rough test that we used to give, but it is totally invalid. Because, <laughs> because, because there are too many variables, and people will say things that are not true because they want to look a certain way, or think they look that way. But this is the, the beginning interview that we give. And it gives people kind of a bearing of what we're going to talk about. Now we have three more tests, but they're different kinds of tests. They're not self-evaluated tests, okay? So this is, now, this is a perceptual design test. What that means is that when you look at A or B, a or B you have a preference for A or B. When you look at number two, you have a precedence for A or B. And as they go down, you will number, you will put the number now. Again, 
on this sheet, you don't have all the ones I'm going to show you on, the, on, the, on here. So you may have the number to begin. But if I say number one, if you pick A or B, you would say A. But I'm not going to ask you that question, right? I want you to just put down A for number one. So if you look at this, I'm going to say, which design is more like me? Not which, not which one do you like better? Which one is more like me? Now that requires you to close your eyes and look at the design and feel it. Is that too complicated? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> I didn't hear you, I'm sorry. Left brain people can do it. Right brain people get like very confused. Okay. okay. Forget about closing your eyes. <laughs> Just pick the one that's more like me, and you know which one is more like you. It feels good, but it doesn't mean you're going to like it. Understand the distinction? It's which one, which one is more like you. So let's go along with it. A. A or B, put down A or B. Two, A or B, put down A or B. Okay, did you get that? Go back to one Okay, on this one, number one and two, you picked an A or a B. What? Yeah, I know you have some of them on there, but disregard that. That's only for your own information. We're going to do it from the uh, PowerPoint. So now you have one or two answers. You have one A, B, or your two A, B. Okay? So you, as I go along, you're going to do the same thing. Number three, A or B. Number four, A or B. Can you go back? I didn't understand. And started looking at the pictures and didn't look at those. Can you ready? Tell me when you're ready. Number three, A or B. Number four, A or B. Okay. Next. Do you have A or B for one, two, three, four? Okay. Now five and six, A or B. Remember, you're the only one that knows this. There's no right or wrong. What? What did you say? No, no, forget about the papers of the time being. There's only examples of what we're doing. This is what really counts. Okay, now, do you have five or six? Now I'm going to go to seven, A and B. Tell me when you're ready. A or B on this, on all these numbers, okay? Next one, nine and ten. A or B? Tell me when you have it, A or B, nine and ten. Okay? Eleven and twelve and thirteen. A to B, the same thing each time. You're going to either pick A or B, which one is more like me? Ready? Okay, tell me when you're ready. How can you decide if you don't know what they mean? Guess. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you miss one. There's no right and wrong on this. Okay. Do we have this page? Yes. 
Okay? 11, 12, and 13, A or B. Next. Okay, that was it. Now. Okay, now I'm going to tell you what you just did. You're going to add up how many A's and how many B's you have. Okay? Once you pick A, doesn't matter the number, just count the ones that you picked the A for. Now, wait a minute. Okay. We have 13 designs. So you pick, tell me how many you picked A for on your, on your site. The choices you made, how many A's? More than one. Doesn't matter what page. Each page had a number, right? One, two, three, four to thirteen. And you picked an A or a B for both for every page. For every design. Okay, all the you with me now? <laughs> if this is simple, did you get taught a little Wait a minute. Please. How many A's did you pick of the design? Okay, that's what I want to hear. Okay. Okay. Now, how many B's did you pick? Okay. Now, okay. The numbers don't matter. It's just I had to know exactly where you're coming from because I'll, get, I'll tell you why this test is important. What? Yeah. Well, okay, but here's the point. I'm going to tell you why this test is important in determining whether you're a dominant right or a dominant, dominant left. All of the A designs are left brain designs. All of the B designs are right brain designs. Now, see if you can see what I mean by that. You see, now, the A signs are rectilinear, no circles, no motion. The right side, the B side, are full of motion, and they're all curvilinear. Everyone is designed that way, okay? These are rectilinear, these are curvilinear. So, by you picking more A's than B's, you're expressing that your brain is more comfortable with uh, uh, less designs, more comfortable with uh, rectilinear designs than with the other. <laughs> Wait, is everyone getting what I'm saying? Yes. What? Is there equal? Okay, that's a good question. Okay, wait a minute. In all of these tests, if you come out equal, it's something we call equilibrium. Equilibrium. That means that in that test, in that test you tested using your left and right brain equally, right? Which is the ideal, because the ideal is that the left and right brain should be communicating all of the time because they have different function. But if you're only communicating in one, if you're saying if you're only communicating in left brain, then you're gonna have all those qualities we looked at which were left brain. On, on your brain's picture that you have there on your page, you'll see all of the qualities in left brain are really structured, organized, language, uh, rational. The ones on the right side of the brain are the opposite. They're impulsive, they're, they don't have language, but you have all that on you. That's why you have the brochure. So, go ahead. What if you come out opposite from the first test? Excuse me? The first test was a question. How about if you come out opposite on this one than from the first test? It's really the same. The same scoring is the same. If you have more left and more right. right. Okay, so you're a little crazy. Okay. 
but that's only a little, okay? That's only a little. Because we have other tests coming. Now we're going to show another kind of test. This one. So this one is what we call an eye, an eye chart test. You have to be able to, in a certain amount of time, in, I always set the time based on the audience. You know, if I have young students that are good, very good readers, I give them only 10 seconds. If I have ordinary, normal people like us, I'll give you 30 seconds. But you have to be able to discern, determine what the phrase is in that picture. Don't shout it out. Just think it to yourself. Okay, now, how many people got this phrase? Just put your hands up. How many people didn't get it? Okay, well. Okay, I'm not going to take you with one, but we'll go with more. Here's another one. Oh, yeah, I'm going to give you only 20 seconds for this. Okay, how many people got that one? Wow, you good. How many Sydney? How many people saw that one? What did it say? No excuses to be accepted. Okay. Just another one. are basically, in a short time, are basically right brain. It's a right brain quality, I'll tell you why in a minute. People who couldn't get it are basically left brain in that kind of test. And what that means is that uh, the right brain has the capacity to synthesize. That's one of the things on the brain, is that they can see things as a whole. Left brain people don't. Left, left brain people are sequential. They go one, two, three, four. That's the, the way their mind works. Right brain people are six, eight, twelve, fourteen, twenty-three, and we'll give you an answer. 
Does that make sense to you? So, I mean, it's interesting. The ones that got it, the ones that didn't. The, the early ones, most people got it, because I gave you a lot of time. But when I shortened the time, fewer people got it. But basically, it was balanced. Pretty much, majority of people, I think, are equal potential on that one. Didn't show us that you were far to the right or far to the left. That's my appraisal of that particular test, okay? Now, here's the, here's where, here's where left and right brain dominance is important in terms of relationships. Now say from one to five is Felix, and from six to 10 is Oscar. That means, you know who Oscar is? Yes. Okay? So if you are a one, say we say, after giving you all the tests, we assume that you're a one. You're a, a left brain dominant of a one party, which means very extreme, like Felix is. If you're a 10, then you're like Oscar, and you're very extreme right brain. But as you move the numbers, say two, three, four, five, that would be the degree to which you are left brain, and not a severe like, like Felix. And the same thing on the right side. So how does this make sense? If you're looking to evaluate how your relationship is with another person, this is not for you alone. This is only in relationships. The relationship could be the spouse, could be a child, could be a father, a parent, anyone. But your relationship can be measured in numbers. And depending if you are a one and a 10, as made, forget about it. Just don't, don't even try it. No way you can get along, right? If you're a two and a nine, there's a possibility, but it's hard. Okay? If you're a three and an, and an eight, that's a pretty good breakup for a mate or a parent and child. If you're a four and a seven, that's even better. The closer you get with the two numbers, the more you're able to see the other side. Because the issue is with left and right brain dominance is that if you're a left brain dominant person, you're going to see things the way that left side of the brain that you had all those things on, basically. But if it's a matter of degree, you will have many of the right brain qualities on the left side. Or on the right side, you'll have many of the qualities on the left side. So we're looking for balance. If you're a three and a seven, that's a pretty good break if you have a new boyfriend or girlfriend. Because even though you're different, there's an advantage to it because the advantage is you'll be able to get some of the things the other person has that you don't have. And that's what we'll get to later on. I'm going to talk about how that works. But do you get this part I'm saying now? Anybody here confused about that? Okay, now here's the question. This is the major question. Everybody since the beginning of the Bible has been asking this question. Do opposites attract? And if so, why? So let's see if you can uh, brainstorm that. From your own information, your own life experience. Do opposites attract? First question, do opposites attract? Yes. Okay. Why? Wait, wait, one other time. One has something, the other one doesn't You want? Good, good answer. What, what were you going to say? You admire the quality that that person has that you don't have. You admire it in the other person. Perfect. Say, oh, you all get it. I mean, you two both expressed it right. Opposites will track because everybody subconsciously feels that they're missing something in their life, in their metabolism or their, their brain thoughts. So they meet a person like that cartoon I showed you, you know, where the love is, you know, each one loved the other one, but they were basically very different. So in time, it showed up. But if you, um, if you fall in love with somebody because you see that 
the woman might say, well, this guy is more responsible than I am. He seems to have it all together. The woman might say, uh, or the guy might say, wow, she's interesting, she's funny, she'll make a nice wife, a good companion. So, but I want to get that from her. You know, that's the unconscious question. If you see that and you want to get what the other person has, you're in trouble. Because you're never going to get it. Okay? But with what I'm going to show you later on, there's a way to overcome that problem. But the, the problem is, if you really think you're going to get something that someone who's different from you into your personality, it won't work that way. Because your dominance is a powerful thing. Your left and right brain dominance is very, very powerful. And it governs the way you make choices, what you think, all these things, right? Okay. Okay, that's just what we said. You both have the right answer, really. Okay, here's a good example. <laughs> this, is, this is his, that's hers, before they got married. And this is both of this, right? So it says, when neatness and sloppiness collide, sloppiness prevails. Yeah. That means you can't fight it if you're in a relationship that one is like Oscar and Felix. <laughs> I mean, Felix is in trouble with Oscar because he can't change him, and vice versa. Right? But the closer you get in those numbers, the more you have a possibility. I'm going to get that into that in a little while. Okay, here's another one, another good example. Be this count. This guy is, he's up and he's, uh, he's in bed, his wife is sleeping. He gets up to go to the bathroom, he comes back to bed at me. I mean, does that size that up? And here's another one. This, they, the couple just comes home from the movie and she's feeling sexual toward him. He says, wait a minute, I gotta hang up my pants. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I gotta make sure everything is neat and I, I'm tying my socks together and I'm looking in the mirror, I'm brushing my teeth. He comes back, she's sleeping. Okay, now this is the, this is the final test, and it's not a test that we can do here, but I'm going to tell you about it. When I worked with Max, with my associate, we would, uh, we would um, uh, when we had 100 people in a room for a workshop, before I started, I would say, look, I would like everybody in this room to consider themselves sloppy, go to the right side of the room and sleep on that, and, uh, pick chairs there, and if you're uh, neat, I want you to go to that side of the room and pick chairs on that side. So they laugh and everything, and they finally file out. But with the 25 workshops I've done, it's always half and half, and I don't know why. You know, it's, it's funny that way. That the neat and sloppy, the kind of balance in a crazy kind of way, and it showed up in this experiment. So they're all sitting there, and then um, they're giving me a lecture, and Max is in the back, and he lights his firecracker, and it's a big blast. Well, everyone gets getting, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me tell you, it's definitely deliberate. It's not a terrorist. Said Max just exploded his uh, firecracker. He shows up to firecracker. I said, but I want to ask you a question. With all you people who heard that noise, how many went like that? All the people on the right side, the sloppy side, put their hands up. And I said, okay, now all the people when they heard that noise said. Didn't move a muscle, but they said to themselves, I wonder what that is. <laughs> Left and right always give the first impulse based on brain dominance. That's what that means. Right brain people will react emotionally, number one. Then they will give more, more information about the situation. Second. And third, they'll be resolved by it. Left brain people, they don't move a muscle until they know it's worthwhile. <laughs> I mean, even the atomic blast and left brain person won't move. <laughs> but right brain people go like that. So that's the point. That's a test that that Max and I developed, and 
psychologists use these all over the country because it works in each piece. It's exemplary people that way. That's how they're going to react. So that's in a lot of the psychology books today. Can I ask a question? If you have two people that are totally different. I'm sorry. You know. If you have two people that are totally different like that, when you, okay, opposites attracted to the say I do. <laughs> okay, so then when you're in that situation, you're neat and he's sloppy. Is it wise to try to change that person? No. Oh, how do you do it? No, you no. Okay. Never try to change a person. Okay. Never. Okay. No, but wait a minute. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean you have to tolerate everything the other person does. But I'm saying you're not going to change them, and you're not even going to change yourself that much. Because people always ask me, "This, how can I be more right brain? How can I be more left brain?" I said, "You can do five percent. That's it, because that's how powerful your brain dominance is." Okay. So you just have to learn to live with it. <laughs> okay, the ISS we went through that. Uh, grounds for conflict here. The idea is the problem with um, falling in love with someone at the opposite time. Okay? All the things that you um, that you like about the person that you think you're going to get, they don't materialize. So you get angry and irritation. And before you know it, you're not talking to each other. Because you feel that you've been betrayed, you know, you were the one to make a mistake in the first place by trying to change the person or think that you could be who they are. Say an accountant marries a woman who's an actress. Now that's a lesson right for him. The accountant he's he's very what? Oh. The accountant is very satisfied with playing with numbers, you know. And she's very satisfied with acting, you know, and being free and all that stuff. So he wants to be freer like her, and she wants to be organized so she can pay the bills on time. But since it doesn't happen automatically, and nobody talks about it, it never happens. So what happens, each person projects onto the other that they're being that way to annoy them. Right? So that's with all these little petty things that build up. Because, you know, I was, in, I was a therapist for 40 years in New York, and I saw all kinds of people, and couples in particular. And it was always the same kind of problem that came from the same place. But I'm the only one that has an answer. You see? And it cost them the same as the, the other therapist who cost them. So let's see. Uh, okay. Now here's an example of mismatched brain styles. A left brain mother or father with a right brain child. A lot of trouble. You can see that, right? Mm -hmm. yep. The child is trying to learn to be accepted and be loved. And their brain style is leading them to be wild and to break rules and think that left brain mother and father, I just want them to be normal. You don't want to be like us. And it doesn't happen because they keep pressing for that and they keep drawing the kid further away. Okay, then it's the right brain mother and father with the left brain child. That's the same thing. The two right brain parents who might be um, the hippies, you know, and and the uh, left brain child, he wants to be dressed up, you know, he wants to, doesn't want to be like his parents. But the thing there is that another question that comes up all the time is. Why do my why does my son or daughter prefer my brother or sister rather than, than his parents? Like it's very common that a kid is fighting with his parents all the time, but he gets along fine with his uncle or his aunt. Because the uncle or aunt is the same brain style they are. So they seem to con convey very indirectly, you know, but the kids pick it up. That's another conflict. Okay. Okay, child and parent tend to play with the same type. Okay, some parents have more conflict. Okay. Now, here's the kind of conflict you have with couples, different kinds of couples. Married couples, gay couples, friends, business and work relationships. They have the same kind of classic uh, conflict that right and left brain perception, perceptual traits and personality. 
That means that all of those couples will get along in the same degree where we showed you the scale of one to ten. Whether they're gay or whether they're friends or whether they're business associates. If you're associating with a person who is in the middle range, you're probably going to get along pretty well. If they're like, oh, you're not going to get along. Oh, get along. <laughs> Okay, now if you have a left brain and a left brain parent, and how do they get along? Well, they get along because they have rational discussions, they control their emotions, and they prop problem solve the same way. That's if your husband and wife are both left brain, you're basically gonna be operating that way, right? Now, if you have a right brain person and a right brain person marries the same type, then there's a lot of drama, there's a lot of emotion, a lot of yelling and crying, expressions of anger and laughter. But they act out like right brain people act out, only with each other. And then there's a left and a right brain misunderstandings, conflicts, all the behavior and ways of proceeding. Okay. Now, okay, here is the answer to every problem we have. Every problem we have. This is the kiss of bliss, because the trick of the three A's is accepting, appreciation, and accommodation. Whoever you're with, a parent, a child, a spouse, a friend, if you employ acceptance, learning that our differences are based on how we perceive the world, not how we, not because we're being nasty to each other, Right? Appreciation. Okay. Appreciation is understanding that the other person has unique qualities that can complement yours. They can't become yours, but they can complement yours. That's called appreciation. Accommodation with this knowledge and goodwill, we can build a better relationship with anyone. And that was a story. I had a lot of couples in my therapy practice, and when they came in to me after maybe 10 visits, and they're having a big argument, I would say, did you try the three A's? And then sure enough, if they went into the three A's, I said, where did you fail? Or which one of those did you fail? And then they walked out understanding each other better. So, that's it for today. Yeah. That's your gift, and I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay, yes. wait, wait, wait. I want to open some questions. Any yeah, questions from the audience? But, but I'm not going to be able to hear you unless I get the microphone. No, 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 no. Yeah. Here, someone, you want me to do it? No. All right. <laughs> okay, but does someone here want to talk?